And welcome everybody to this week's Maternity and Midwifery Hour. Now this is session 10 of series 13 of the Maternity and Midwifery Hour. Uh, my name's Sue MacDonald and I'm the ch chair and curator for the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and the Maternity and Midwifery Hour. And it's my pleasure to be chairing this evening's session. And I'm joined by two lovely guests, Ruth Lester, Dr. Ruth Lester and Natasha Carr. And because we always do this to our guests, we always ask them to share a moment of the week with us. And they'll come on screen in a minute and share a moment of the week. So perhaps, Tasha, can you share a moment of the week with us? Hello, everybody, and thank you for having me here this evening. I think my positive moment of the week is my two children. They're doing GCSEs and A-levels, and they are finishing this week. So we've got a much happier household and less <laughs> our household. So I'm very pleased this week. Oh, wow. Does that mean celebrations over the weekend, do you think? It, w it will do, yes. My older one's going out with his friends and the younger one's coming down to Dartmouth with me for the weekend. Ooh. Yeah. That sounds good. But it's, a, oh gosh, doesn't it take you back to, it never leaves you, does it? All that work for eight exams, all things. Well, well done them. Absolutely. Fabulous. Thank you so much. How about Ruth? Have Hi. you got a moment? Yeah, I thought I have a grandma moment. <laughs> you see the white hairs. Fabulous. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I've got six children, or we have six children between us, but I actually oh. have only three. And um, three of the six are males, large males. And it's been tradition that I have laughed every time they come in the house. They go straight to the fridge and the um, and the larder cupboard to see what mum has been cooking. Oh. <laughs> yeah. This weekend on Sunday, one of my sons came with his children and one of them is a little boy of 10. And blow me down, he went in to the cupboard <laughs> the fridge <laughs> and the look on his face when he saw the chocolate cake was something special. <laughs> well. My mouth is watering now. <laughs> this is homemade chocolate cake. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yes, I um, Yes, I'm a retired lady, so I have a little bit of to do this for the grandchildren. Fantastic. Well, audience, while your mouths are watering with the thought of a chocolate cake and then celebrations for the end of exams, I'll just, rem I'll just welcome all of you here. And I know there'll be some new people to the Maternity and Midwifery Hour and some people who are very regular. And I know yesterday when I was at the Maternity and Midwifery Festival, a lot of people said, oh, you're real, <laughs> not just uh, coming in on my screen every Wednesday. So I know there's a lot of you out there. Well, we started, for those of you who are new, right at the beginning of the UK lockdown and COVID-19 in March 2020. I cannot believe this is four years now. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that midwives, student midwives, people in maternity services had access to information and knowledge at a time when we couldn't meet only professionally with masks and all the rest of it. We couldn't have study days or conferences or festivals. Um, so getting knowledge out there was quite difficult. So we started at the one hour and at that time, right at the beginning, we had a lot about COVID and what was going on in maternity services. And we've kind of developed a little bit since then into other things, because of course, COVID isn't the issue that it was before. And, and just to reassure everyone, everything's recorded on the Maternity Midwifery Forum. So this is recorded and is being kept by our lovely friends at Matflix. So if you need anything for a revalidation, for study day preparation, for doing an assignment or a dissertation, Matflix will have loads and loads of information, loads and loads of um, videos. I think we're about 1600 videos there and they're all really good quality items and um, well worth looking at but the only warning i would give is a little bit addictive so when you go searching and you find something interesting you might find you can't stop yourself watching the next one and the next one you can get some of these on um youtube but the problem with that is sometimes you get something completely different after the video you're looking for and you're interested in and that's another warning you might get something very different so Try the Matflix, the links on the resources as, as some of the references for tonight's session. Um, and that's that's free to access and you're very welcome to watch, share and discuss with your colleagues. Very good 
actually for revalidation. And um, we, we, we also want to say at this point, big thank you, as we always do, to midwives and student midwives and all the people within the maternity services providing care to mothers and babies and families. So it's a hard time as it has been. Actually, it feels like forever, but it's not forever. I know we're short of staff. We need more staff and um, to do the care we want to do. And it does feel as though you must be kind of running in treacle, but you're doing grand, so keep up with it. But look after yourselves, because if you don't look after yourself, it doesn't help in looking after other people. And I know there's quite a bit of sickness at the moment as well. So that's we're always, always having to cover that as well. I'm just doing a quick check of my time. Um if only you could see the rest of my room. I'm very glad you can't because there's clocks all around me and a, a lot of a heap of reading for me to do. So that we, we might be exploring that in the next couple of weeks because I know I always give you some nice reading to do. Now this week we've. I wish I'm. I need to wish all Muslims a blessed Eid Al Adha, and I hope I pronounce that correctly and say Eid Mubarak to our mu Muslim friends and colleagues. So it's, I know it's a very positive and special time. So I hope it is for all of you there. Um, and we were talking about this yesterday. We were at the uh, Manchester Festival. It was fantastic. Manchester's lovely. People are so warm. And we got a very warm welcome. We had look, met lots of midwives and student midwives and people who want to become student midwives. So don't believe everything people are saying in the media about midwives, students not become, wanting to become student midwives, because there are lots of people who do. And that's great. Had a brilliant day. We had some fantastic speakers. And if you want to have a look, it's accessible on Netflix as well. Fantastic sessions. Far too many. I, and if I said I had a favourite one, that wouldn't be very fair, because actually, every time I listen to one of the presentations, I thought, well, this is my favourite. Oh, no, this is my favourite, because they all had really challenging and special components to, for, for you to think about, how could I change my practice? How What could I add? And sometimes it just makes you think a little bit differently, which is great. Now, I'm also now going to get on my election soapbox now i'm not going to tell you who to vote for in the uk these are the uk elections so everyone else in the world forgive me about this but i'm getting on my little soapbox because i'm going to say to you tonight midnight is the closing date for getting your postal vote in so there's no excuse for not getting your vote in get get it uh, re registering for that and do vote don't be one of these people who said oh i don't know who to vote for or it's no good of me voting people fought for your vote and this is this is me getting very cross and go into that place take your little passport or whatever with you prove who you are and then go into that little booth and put your cross in one of those places and before you do that it's a good opportunity to just check out what those candidates are offering for maternity services and for midwives just check out if you can Send one and your local one an email and say, what are you doing for us? What are you doing for the women and babies in this constituency? There, that'll put them on the spot. That'll be good. But do vote. It's worth doing it. You, you, every vote matters. Now, I'm going to, I'm moving very quite quickly onto this, the, the meat of today's session. Now, we're look, we, we know that recently we've, we've moved into having, and I'm going to flash this little book, which I quite often do, the Nursing Midwifery Council Standards of Proficiency with Midwives. And this really brought into being and made more formal the need for all of us to get into examining the newborn very carefully, doing the whole holistic examination, which incorporates the NIPE, which I know Tasha's going to talk a little bit about. And it's meaning that we need more knowledge about that examination and how we do it and how we provide care to the mother and the family through the examination. And we thought we'd just focus on one very important area to just sort of clarify what can you can find and what you need to do about it. And it's you need the skills and the knowledge and the anatomy. And I know you're going to get quite a bit of that in this session, which is fantastic. So we're going to be looking at the examination of the upper limbs and the importance of support and ongoing care and information for the mother and the family for, with when there's a prob problem for that child with an upper limb, upper limb issue. 
and making sure they reach their full potential. So we're going to start, I'm going to introduce, I'm delighted to do so, introduce Natasha Carr, a senior lecturer in the midwifery department uh, of the um, Birmingham City University. And she's responsible for providing, supporting and facilitating teaching and learning on both long and short BSc honours midwifery programmes and teaches alongside colleagues on the examination and newborn programmes. And she's also leads the Professional Midwifery Advocate Programme. She works clinically. She's also as a PMA and a newborn and infant physical examination and IP practitioner. And just because she likes a challenge, she's going to undertake a PhD in health. So well done to Natasha. Natasha, the screen is now yours. Welcome. And thank you for coming this evening. Thank you very much. And that PhD is, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It is possible oh. that to do that. We're getting there. We're getting Yay. there. But focusing this evening on congenital upper limb differences and the role of the midwife in this um, systematic examination of the newborn. And thank you very much for having us here this evening. So, if you're a IP newborn infant physical examination practitioner or systematic ex examination of the newborn, and that takes it out of England, it takes it to the all four um, countries, it's about realising what you should be able to, to do. So obviously we're looking at the eyes, heart, and the um, hips and the testes when we're doing those examinations. However, as a midwife, you're never just isolating yourself when you're doing examinations. You're, you're looking wider than that. And that's why it's a systematic examination. And it requires extensive skills and knowledge of anatomy, physiology, of how to communicate the findings to the birthing family. When all appears normal, and that's most of the time, however, it's considering what to say and what to do when a difference is noticed as well. And in this session, we're going to focus on the examination of the upper limb as part of that systematic mm -hmm. examination of the newborn. When we're teaching our students at, at Birmingham City University, particularly focusing down on examination of the limbs, we say that they need to apply their underlying anatomy and physiology of development of the musculoskeletal system. So these are the things that you need to know as a midwife if you're considering um, upper limb differences. You need to be able to recall the examination of the musculoskeletal system and be able to critically examine all the main anomalies of the musculoskeletal system. And importantly, apply those NIPE principles, those newborn infant physical examination principles to the holistic approach to that examination. So just to put a little bit of context um, in here for us, where are our limb differences actually sitting in the grand scheme of things? So we can keep this in context a little bit. And this just prevent, um, presents some of our UK congenital anomaly statistics for us. And I think you can probably see my, my pointer there, but this covers all limb deficiencies uh, or differences, not just our upper limb ones. But you can see this is a prevalence per 10,000 live births and it's under 30. So we are looking at relatively small numbers. But that does mean that as midwives, we may not come across very many of these in our times as, as looking after mums and babies. So we really do have to think very carefully about how we approach these parents and how we approach our examinations, because we are probably not going to become very experienced in doing this as midwives examining babies on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need to rehearse how we approach parents, what we say to parents, and bear a few things in mind. And hopefully, as we go through the presentation, some of those things, the consideration for our practice will, will pop up. So we tend to do um, two main examinations as midwives in, in the UK. The first one is our initial examination of the newborn. So once the baby's just been birthed, whatever kind of birth the baby's had, we'll do an initial examination you know, within the first few minutes into that first hour after birth. And it's really important that we observe carefully. We can miss things, so that observation shouldn't be taken lightly. The initial examination should involve a general observation, a good top 
to toe and that obviously includes the upper limbs as well but we should be looking at posture the newborn's posture symmetry of movement um, symmetry of size shape alignment and position and the upper limbs will form part of that observation as well I've got an example there of syndactyly. Now, there's a lot of complex words that come along with upper limb differences. This is just joined digits. And a very simple task that we do as midwives when a baby is born, we count fingers and toes. It might seem very, very simple, but it is incredibly important to actually take fingers and toes and go one, two, three, four, five. And note if there's any fusion or any webbing, or that we do actually have five fingers on the well, thumb on each hand and four fingers, but about five digits. I've known a case where um, a baby has managed to find its way home into the community before an extra digit was picked up on a hand. So that baby will have gone through an initial examination. It will have gone through its nightly examination at 72 hours that we would have to in the morning. And it was picked up by a community midwife who undertook her role meeting the baby and family for the first time and did a really thorough observation and examination of the baby in her own right. That baby really should have got home before we spotted something like that. That should have been picked up early because that would leave the parents with all sorts of feelings about well, why wasn't it and, and, and so on. Um, so don't overlook very, very simple things. And we know how busy it is out there. We do need to do these examinations. And a lovely article that Ruth will probably refer to later, she's one of the, the authors on that article, notes that 57% of differences are noted in the postnatal period. So we're not necessarily picking up that there's going to be an upper limb difference in our babies antenatally. So as midwives, we need to be really vigilant and we'll be providing care for a lot of these babies. We need to document. If we do notice something or we confirm that everything is normal, documentation is key at birth. And if we do notice a difference, start that referral process early, because the earlier that parents are referred in, and babies referred into a specialist system, the better so that they can receive specialist care. We then move on that every baby will have um, a systematic examination of the newborn or a nightly examination within 72 hours, whether they're born at home or they're born in the hospital or whichever location they're born at in the UK. This is a much more detailed examination of the newborn and you have to undergo specialist training. But as um, Sue was commenting earlier, this is now a, a standard in the undergraduate curricula. So all our student midwives are being trained in the newborn and infant physical examination, systematic examination of the newborn. It's very important to note the history. So before you've even gone to speak to parents and have a look at the baby, you're having a good look at the history. Is there anything in the notes? Is there anything antenatally that has been picked up? Look for those risk factors. Is there anything in the associated history? Also talk to parents. So have they noticed you know, anything with their baby? Are they happy? Do they have any questions? However, if you do note there's a difference or you suspect that there's a difference, you need to be very careful with how you phrase things. So parents don't think they're to blame for anything that may have happened with their baby. So how we couch our questions to parents needs a little bit of thinking about. Again, we're repeating that observation on our baby exactly as you did with that initial examination of the newborn. We've got transferable skills as midwives and we're going to do that general observation again, top to toe. How are our upper limbs moving in relation to the rest of the body? Posture, symmetry of movement, size, shape and alignment position and any differences may range from something very simple such as an accessory digit to more complex presentations it could be a one-off something it could be part of a syndrome and Ruth will pick up on those more complexities a little bit later on the other things that we do as a midwife as part of the systematic examination of the newborn we use palpation more so than we would do in the initial examination 
and we're going to try and identify the presence of component parts. Have we actually got all the bones that we should have, starting with the clavicles, moving down through the humerus, radi radius, ulna, our fingers? Obviously, it's difficult to feel those individual bones. The hands are made up of multiple mm -hmm. bones. But you'll see, you know, is the baby moving? Have we got our grasp reflexes as well? Um, have we got our normal range of movement? Have we got asymmetry? We have to think about, well, if we have got asymmetry, well, what on earth does that mean? We don't want to alarm parents. So as a midwife, our role isn't to diagnose. And we'll get on to what our role is on the next slide. We need to think about, have we got loss of movement? And what might that actually mean? So, for example, a brachial plexus damage to the, the bundle of nerves coming through the neck down into the sort of into the shoulder slightly, then it could be, well, yes, I picked up something as a risk factor. This baby had a traumatic birth. There was a shoulder dystocia. Those pictures of the jigsaw are coming together. But again, I'm not going to tell the parents that because that's not my role as a midwife. But I could ask them, have you noticed anything with your baby? How, how's the baby moving? Are you concerned about anything? Very general questions, but no questions that are going to suggest that the parents have done anything to cause any problems with their baby. We're going to document, and specifically around the NIPE or the SEN, it's about documenting on S4N, so it's, it's specific NIPE documentation. Baby's clinical notes, and that varies from hospital to hospital. Mostly these are electronic these days, but children still have and babies still have the um, red books. Um, so those are carried around with them. So it's important everywhere that that child is going to go. The documentation is clear. And we have NMC guidance, Nursing and Midwifery Council guidance in the UK about how to document and our professional responsibilities around that. And things like the um, person child health record is a joint form of documentation for multiple healthcare professionals, and it's important to have that joint information in there. At this point, we're going to be doing some referrals. So from the NIPE point of view, we should have local arrangements in place and for any other arrangements as well, that if we pick up any other differences, including our upper limb differences, you need to make sure that you're at your own hospitals that you do have referral pathways in place and if you don't know if it's the first time you've come across something because it isn't something that's common to you then you need to ask there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking if you are unsure and luckily in Birmingham for example we're very lucky to have a big children's hospital so our local hospitals within Birmingham have a, a ready resource on tap for them for upper limb differences and those will get that will get referred to a little bit later on I think it's also important that as midwives we maintain our training and our competency as well because we may train in you know we now 2024 but if we don't practice those skills we might become a little bit rusty and you might need to do some CPD you might need to have a refresher over those skills you might need to go on study days about um, differences that you're not familiar with. So it's about your professional um, knowledge and maintaining that. And only you know what you know. Um, so you need to think about your own CPD and decide in your sphere of practice what is good for you so that you are competent. The next few slides I'll just go through very, very quickly, but some examples, although many of them are very, very rare because we know that you know, the numbers of limb deficiencies, uh, differences rather, is small, but they can have a long lasting impact on parents if we don't get that initial communication right. So here you can see, for example, humerus. Is it the right length? Is it actually there? Hands, size, shape, posture, inflection. Have we got all the digits? Have we got nails on there? And our reflexes, which I mentioned a moment ago, we should check our baby's reflexes. Are they symmetrical? Um, if not, question, why not? Some more very, very rare um, instances of upper limb differences here as well, which you can have a little look at. So 
also separation of the clavicles in there, shoulder dislocation, it's very rare, but if you've had a very traumatic birth, it may be something that you see. And whilst that can be solved and treated, there's, there's other conditions that will need much longer management. And our brachial plexus injuries, we mentioned these briefly a moment ago. Um, so you may see some of these, a clumps palsy, herbs palsy, and your reflexes won't be very good, or rather the baby's reflexes won't be so good. So if as a healthcare professional, as a midwife, you notice an upper limb difference and you seek advice about what to do about this, at some point you, you're going to have to talk to the parents. You can't hide this. It's originally on, on the left hand side there, it talks about breaking bad news. But on the right hand side, I thought, no, I don't want to say breaking bad news because actually you're just breaking different news. You know, perhaps parents were expecting you to say, oh, yeah, lovely, lovely. You know, that's great. Off you go home. And you, you're actually going to impart some different news to that and set them off on a different journey that they perhaps weren't expecting. But if you're going to give somebody, you could call it bad news, you could call it different news, news that they weren't expecting. We need to think about how we actually do that, because if we get this wrong, this is something that can stay with families for an awfully long time and this is where as midwives we can actually make a big difference. So there is a model called the spike model it was developed in oncology but it's a good model when we, we need to tell somebody something and we just need to consider about how we tell them and we're not going to give them a diagnosis we're just going to tell somebody that we've noted a difference here and we need to do something about it. So we need to think about the setup. We need to think about what we want to say in advance. So if we've got some idea that we're going to come across a difference already, we can plan this in our head. However, if you're the person, you're the midwife that's just noticed something, a bit less planning. But we can think about it from now onwards in case we come across anything. You might want to suggest um, that there are the mom birthing um, family have their significant other, others there or a friend or a relative maybe they want to call someone in to be with them and you know, whilst you have that discussion time and sitting down with somebody so that is really really important time is always a problem in midwifery we don't have time to do anything however we have to make the time for this to sit on a bed next to somebody to sit on a chair next to somebody and just hold their hand, offer some comfort is incredibly important. So we have to set up that information giving importantly. Perception. Before I tell somebody that I've just noticed that your baby has X, Y or Z, I need to ask them, have you noticed anything about your baby that you're worried about? Have you noticed anything you know, over the last few days or, you know, since your baby's been born. Open-ended questions. What do you understand about this? So you're giving the, the birthing families chance to actually ask, but also a chance to tell you that, oh, no, I didn't notice that. And I was going to ask you about that. It gives them that sense of control that we're on the same page here. You've noticed it. I've noticed it. Let's have a conversation about it but also checking that they're ready to hear this and that they're receptive to some information or actually maybe we need to come back later. We also then need to actually give that information. Um, what would you like to know? Different people want to know different amounts of information. Sometimes we can't take all that information in at once and we might need to stage that, give a bit of information now, come back later. And also that level of information, it's good to know who you're talking to. But even if you've got somebody who you deem to be always a healthcare professional, they're not being a healthcare professional at that moment. They're being a mommy and a daddy or a birthing family. And the emotions will take over. We need some knowledge, but also it's about imparting some knowledge to the parents as well using non-technical language, but gentle language, but not patronising language. You know, it's important. Small bites of information. 
Do we have some written information to back up what we're saying? So if we're delivering difficult news, it might go in one ear and out the other. Can't remember, I was upset, I was crying, or I was stunned by what you've just told me. If we can have written information to back up what we're saying, that's important. And then we've got emotions as well. We need to consider the birthing family's emotions. Do they need time alone? Do they not want to be alone? Where do they want to be with their baby? Do they want to be around all these other babies that they may deem as normal? Or they might not want to have a side room. It's about working out what that family wants and not what I think they should be having. So you have to have a dialogue there. It's also about thinking about us as midwives and our emotions as well, because if we haven't encountered this particular difference before, we might need to talk it through as well. But predominantly, this is about the birthing family's emotions. And the emotions will go on. The support that's required is continuous, and this lead is going to lead into Ruth's um, presentation. So emotion emotional support and empathy is required as per the spike model. Reassurance and support is important. And that will go mean that we have to hand over that information. So to health visitors, community midwives, and make sure there's a smooth transition and the next step of support is in place for these parents and baby. Honesty is absolutely important. But we do need some knowledge. So if we're thinking at the moment, oh gosh, I really don't know what all those words were. I mean, I don't know anything about the limb differences. Then now's the time to think, right, OK, let me think about that and, and learn something extra about it. Referral is essential. So again, if you don't have those referral pathways, that's something we need to go back to our organisations and think about. You know, what will we do if we have a baby with a limb um, difference? and support groups, they are absolutely essential because once parents go home and the baby goes home, there can be a lag in time before they get to meet the appropriate um, healthcare professional who's going to take them the next part of their care journey. And there are some fantastic support groups out there. REACH is one of them that Ruth is going to go on and talk about. But for example, just at Birmingham Women's Hospital, um, Women's and Children's Hospital, we've got our children's hospital just down the road. There are activities for children and families. Um, they do a, a hand camp, for example, which I think is linked to Reach when I was talking to Ruth. And it's, it's just to normalise things. You know, these children are children fundamentally, and they might have a difference, but it really does not stop them. And we mustn't stop them as healthcare professionals. Um, a whole load of useful resources there. So when you are recapping this, then you can have a look at those references. And I know Sue has a whole lot of references for you as well. And that brings you to the end of my short presentation. And I should hand you over. Thank you very much. That's lovely. So if you have any questions for Natasha or Ruth, please do put them in and then we can answer them. small or big questions. We are quite happy to have anything. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce now Ruth Lester, OBE. She's a retired consultant plastic surgeon and she specialised in the management of children with upper limb differences at Birmingham Children's Hospital. Um, and in 2018, she was awarded an OBE for the services to children and young people with limb differences. And since retirement, I think she's been pretty busy, actually. She says, a, like a lot of retired people, she'll say, oh, I'm a retired woman, not much going on. And then you find she's doing an awful lot, including working as a trustee with REACH, um, the music charity OH. MI and the Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. So welcome to you, Ruth, this evening. The screen is now yours. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us this evening. 
Thank you, Sue, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I'm sorry I can't see you all. <laughs> Maybe, um, it's, it's always difficult speaking to a screen. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm aware of you being there. Um, Sue has introduced me. I, I moved sideways from being um, a consultant surgeon at the Children's Hospital uh, in retirement, uh, I'd known about REACH uh, as the charity that supported our children with upper limb differences that we saw. And we were seeing about 400, 600 new babies a year. Um, and we, um, so REACH was always with me. So it was a sort of natural sideways move to become a trustee of that organization. We're talking really about parental expectation of having a normal, perfect child. And it comes as a bit of a shock when things aren't quite right. And we're talking now about really visible differences that may or may not have been picked up uh, antenatally. I'm just showing these because it's the sort of follow on from, um, uh, from my moment of the week. I mean, I didn't expect to have two great big lads who tower over me and also uh, this is what you do two plastic surgeons my husband's a plastic surgeon as well and both retired we go paddling um at the seaside which I hadn't done for years and I was determined to go what we're dealing with today is this huge range of I'm calling them anomalies but they're really differences um, and there's a huge, enormous range from the very simple little accessory digit to a whole forearms missing or bent or all sorts. And it's really no one would expect you to know any much about the conditions. Uh, they need to be dealt with by um, or looked at by a specialist. I have put this in, Tash, I didn't warn you I was putting this in, but I, I thought I would. These are the things we're not dealing with today, but if you see them, we could do with having them early. Um, the vascular necrosis of the newborn is extremely rare, but we do, if we can, we do sometimes do a fasciotomy within the first 24 hours. The little skin tags are worth sending because we can do them as babies under local anesthetic. After six weeks of age, they argue with us a bit too much, but under six weeks or, or under a few months, you can cuddle them and pop in a little local and just do them by being breastfed or cuddled. So it's worth getting those through to your local plastic surgery or hand surgery service. The story about obstetric brachial plexus palsy injuries and the paralyzed arm, thats a, a, it's a whole story in itself, birth injuries. And I'm sure you, Sue, I'm sure you've, you, you tackle this at some point. So I'm not going to tackle it. Um, but it, in a way, it, it, it's part, if there is pain, then it might well be an injury of some sort. And you may have to deal with the injury and deal with the parental anger that, that this my baby has been injured. So I'm not going to deal with those. Um, we're going to look at the actual, as, as Tash has talked about, the congenital hand and upper limb differences, which are rare. You may only see one or two in your lifetime. Um, we only pick up about 50% antenatally. There's an interesting. Oh, it's moved on itself. Never mind. Um, let's see if I can go back. The What we... In reach, what we heard was that parents were going through a pretty traumatic experience when they discovered that their baby had an upper limb difference. And I was hearing it in my ears. So, oh, no, wrong way. So um, we had this captive audience, um, if you like, of parents not related to the NHS. And we thought we would find out what's really going on, how the parents are responding after the um, uh, this this unexpected news, and my colleagues Andrew is a registrar, um, a plastic surgery registrar. Orla is a psycho a psychosocial nurse up in Edinburgh, and Wheelam is a colleague of mine who is currently in um, Malaysia or somewhere, but he, he's still with me online, and he's the editor of the Journal of Hand Surgery. So it was rather nice having him on board, and we got this paper. Um, uh, published. It didn't matter where it was published, really, but it, it was published in a journal of hand surgery. 
And what we aimed to do, it was a survey, was to evaluate parental experience and to determine when and how pay, parents first learned of the difference, how what information they were given, to uh, try and understand the emotional experience that they were going through and ask the parents how the journey could be improved. We used um, a national cross-sectional survey all throughout UK and Ireland, and we but we restricted it to 10 years old because we thought uh, uh, children under 10 years old so that the parents could probably remember their experience. Um, and it was mixed methodology. Some of it was quantitative and some of it was a thematic analysis of qualitative response. So we left them space to write their feelings down. Um, uh, the, we got 261 respondents. It wasn't all reach. We put it out on social media so that we got other parents from other organisations as well. And a pretty good covering of the UK. We had a huge range of um, abnormalities, although 20 over 25% didn't know what the abnormality was called, which is interesting. Um, in terms of the quantity, analysis, um, we had antenatal diagnosis in 41% uh, and postnatal in 56% with some remaining uncertain when, they couldn't remember when they were had got the diagnosis. Relevant information, only 28% of our parents felt that they were given relevant information at the time of the discovery. Um, we went back to say most uh, to ask them whether they would like to receive the information about the diagnosis before birth. And it was an interesting response because those who knew of the anomaly before birth wanted to know before birth, but those who learned of the anomaly postnatally wasn't quite so many wanting to know before birth. And we know uh, that we can only achieve about 50% of antenatal diagnosis because the, the guidelines for ultrasound um, uh, only really ask for whether there are two bones in the forearm. So a lot of them are missed antenatally. We don't think there's any best pathway. We have to go with what pathway we've got. We can't, I don't think we can change that pathway. We're only going to see 50%. And so the approach has to be tailored um, to the individual. So 54% only saw a specialist within three months. And I think that's quite a long time. And we're beginning to think about doing something about that from our point of view. I'm still in, in touch with my congenital hand, oops, um, congenital hand colleagues. Um, and if they could now offer video calls, even a 10 minute, 15 minute video call within the first week after birth, that would be wonderful. I'm getting rather negative views from my colleagues at the moment saying they've got too much to do and they can't do it. But the Birmingham lot are, are going to pilot it. I'm very pleased about that. 73% felt unsupported when they left hospital after the delivery. Um, and over 90% searched for information themselves. I'm not surprised because these are rare. Nobody really understands what's going on. But it's not a, it's not a fantastic story. So we want to try and uh, improve that. The, the, the three things that they were bothered about, parents, lack of support, the, even the doctor said something different because they've never seen them before. Um, and they didn't know where to go for information. Concerns about the future for the child. The first thing is the parents say, oh, gosh, is my child going to be bullied at school? Is my, you know, how are they going to manage? How are they going to go to the loo themselves? You know, all sorts of things. Are they going to be able to play with other children? And the other problem was about the communication about what would happen next. In other words, the, the referral pathway. And that may not be straightforward. And that's that's not not mid midwife's issue it's an issue for um the specialist services to make sure locally that the referral pathways are clear offer of termination is a difficult one um it's it's it as soon as that's done it's extremely negative and if there are apologies it's extremely negative because we know 
that these children are likely to be absolutely normal. Here are some pictures of our kids. Um, and they are going to live a, a very useful, productive life. And if you start with an apology or negativity, that is going to impact immediately on the way the parent um, perceives this child that hasn't come out quite perfect. Um, so you're on the front line and we know it's very rare and you can be as shocked as the parents are because you may never have seen it before. Whatever Tasha said is that the spike system, whatever it is, is, is very relevant. Um, they, these parents need reassurance and support. And one of the main feelings that these parents have is guilt. And it's they think they've done something in the pregnancy. They've got a um, uh, an abnormality somewhere in the family, something. And it really needs to be stressed that it's not their fault. And I'm coming to that in a minute as to how easy it is to do that. Um, and we've talked about uh, inquiring locally as to what the appropriate referral pathway is. Uh, you, you may not have seen it. You're going to have to do the investigation. But remember that children are incredibly adaptable, and particularly these children with upper limb. If they're only born with one limb, they do, um, they're do. they amazing. So just very simple learning points. Single limb involvement they will need a further consultation, but it's likely they will live a normal and productive life and they're unlikely to have other problems. If it's bilateral, they're going to need a bit more investigations, but they are still likely to have a relatively normal, successful life. Where there are multiple anomalies on your examination, then they need more urgent referral because you can't, um, you can't offer them an immediate and complete reassurance. But then they're on a journey then of discovery um, that you won't know, and maybe we won't know. Not everybody will know what the future for that child is, but it's a journey. And they will need to see the specialists, the geneticists and the pediatricians and ourselves, the, the specialist hand surgeons. Um, let's start with the embryology uh, because in a way that gets rid of the guilt. It's a very easy. The baby's hand is fully formed six to seven weeks after fertilization. It's fully formed. It starts at a four weeks and by six, seven weeks, it's there. All fingers, everything separated. It's amazing. So the problem or the mistake that I'm going to, I'm going to call it a mistake, happens before mum even knew she was pregnant. So it is nothing that the mother's done. She said, oh, did I have a glass of wine in the, uh, the beginning of the pregnancy? Or something like that. They're going to think, have I done something? But they haven't. It happens so fast. And the, the, um, the baby is developing at an extraordinary rate. And um, as you can see on the, uh, there's this little video is, is uh, I don't know how they did it, how it was made. But it's a very fast um, formation. I've put this slide up. It's far too complicated. Even I struggle with it. But the, the, it, in a way, because it's so complicated, it's not surprising that there is the occasional mistake um, in the in the patterning, the way the limb is 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 formed in those first few weeks it goes from. Um, proximal to distal, back and the front are different, and the, the one side of the hand and the other side of the hand are different. And there are things called sonic hedgehog, uh, little messengers that go between from the cells to the um, as, as they are developing, which can easily get uh, mistaken in them. And it's not necessarily genetic, it's just a happening. Um, so, yes, again, it's rather complicated. Where the mistake occurs will give a certain type of difference. You don't need to know all that. The important thing is knowing that it's happened very early in the pregnancy. That baby was fully there by six weeks. Mum only may have missed a period, but the actual mistake will have occurred even earlier than that. So I'm repeating what Tasha said. Be honest. If you don't know, you don't know. Uh, and you have to find out. You can, but you can be positive 
And I think that's in incredibly important for these parents to hear something positive. You can take away the guilt pretty quickly by saying, okay, this is, this is a little mistake that happened way before you even knew you were pregnant. The access to a specialist, uh, that's an interesting one. It's a joint effort here to get that right um, in the uh, immediate, before they leave hospital, they need to know what their pathway is. But the one thing you can do is refer to REACH. And, and REACH have got a wealth of information and they've got other parents and they've got children running around with these differences, which the mother with this tiny little baby can't see. And they need to be able to see what the future for their child is. And it's only by meeting other parents and other children that they'll get that. So REACH is the sort of forefront of the children's. And there are other organisations as well. And um, we've uh, written a booklet for new parents, which is about to be published on the website. Uh, and there are other organisations that can help as well. So what is REACH? It's, it's really a family of families. I've loved being part of it. It's been really quite fun. Um, and they it, 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 it sort of enables and empowers children to live what we're calling a life beyond limits. They are not limited, these children and the adults. And we now, the, the organisation was formed 40 years ago. So we're now dealing with um, uh, a lot of adults and uh, older, uh, older young adults and older adults who have got through life very well and come back to us as as um, as role models, doing all sorts of things. Um, and we run, um, obviously, run uh, weekends, family weekends, and we run. Uh, there is a, a an activity week for Reach and Tash. No, the one in Birmingham Children's is is our own West Midlands one. Um, that we look at the children in the West Midlands region holistically, and we run a hand camp for them on activities through the Birmingham Children's hand and upper limb service. But that is that's local. But we always communicated with Reach about it, so they know about it. And and uh, there's a crossover between the two organisations. Um, there, there are also we. There is a um, a, um, a a list of children's hand clinics, which hopefully Sue will give you uh, access to on the resources. Uh, I made I, before I retired. I made sure that happened. So that around the country, um, there is a list of the centres where there are dedicated specialist children's hand clinics. Uh, and you should be able to access that so that you know who to refer to and where. The REACH family, uh, as I say, is, is wonderful. And if you look at our, the ambassadors at the bottom, um, you may know some of these names. They're well-known people who have, have done extraordinary things despite their limb anomaly. And they come back and talk to the parents uh, and and they're, they're a great help, um, especially for the new parents who really can't see beyond the loss of an arm. They think, oh, panic. But then when they see the other children climbing, running around, swimming, everything, uh, they feel a lot better. So that's, those are our ambassadors who have been a, a great help to the organisation. Just at the, just, I've, Put this in um, just to show you what these children can do. Uh, we had a lot of fun during lockdown, and there was a, a, a lady put this together. And only for a minute, I particularly want to show you the uh, the brass instruments, which are to a certain extent easier for the children that they can tackle up. They tackle everything. I need to exit that. That's enough. I don't know how much you heard of, of that, but um, uh, they, it was really, during lockdown, it was a great exercise to do for them. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ruth. I mean, that's that's a really positive. I love the image of the, the orchestras working away because that's so normal because this is kind of, I guess this is the problem because we're balancing 
parents expecting the perfect baby having to deal with something different to perfection but it's a, it's still you know a healthy child that will have potential and i think that's really lovely to have included that um i'm waiting now for those of you watching if you have a question do send it through to paul and then it'll come through to me i mean i was i was sort of i was very interested because you both talked about guilt um and that's and I, and I thought the the way Ruth you talked about the sort of mistake happening bet- before six weeks somewhere would go some way but do you think will that take care of the guilt issue do you think oh, it may not it takes time to get rid of it but it's acknowledging the guilt that's probably the most important thing. and that's the one thing I've done you know when I've seen these babies in clinic and in fact I did see quite a few online during lockdown through mm. reach they were uh, the parents and it's actually expressing it I bet you're feeling guilty or something in other words expressing the emotions that they're feeling um empathy which is what you talked about Tasha and it, it's acknowledging that that is likely to be there Mm. Uh, and that's it goes some way to removing it uh obviously it's a, it's an individualized and some some mothers struggle really hard um to get over what's what's happened others uh, find it helpful and they say okay all right but it's it's only about talking about talking openly about the potential for guilt that it's worth um will help yeah, I suppose, and I suppose the other thing I, that, that followed, sort of went through my brain is the sort of idea that there might be some rejection of the child, and I don't know whether that what we can do, and maybe this is a question more for Natasha, how we can make sure that the maternal infant interaction is sort of nurtured, because they, they this is for most of these cases, especially if you've you haven't missed picking up the difference it's going to be quite early in the in the relationship isn't it maybe in the delivery labor ward or if you're at home you know just soon after the birth uh, absolutely i think as soon as we pick up any differences be they up in the differences or or any other it's about keeping that rapport and communication going with the parents and making sure the next caregivers at the next stage even if it's just upstairs on the postnatal ward it's personal ward to home it's so to, to community community to health visitor that that next support is in place and those parents are not going to be alone at mm. any point it's very easy for people to fall through a system mm. uh, particularly as the state of the nhs is at the moment we won't go into the politics of that but yeah. we just <laughs> need to make sure that we've got very clear communication make sure that we have done our part to make sure the next part is going to be in place and yet yeah, normally we've discharged parents and babies by 10 days I don't think there's any place in discharging babies you know with they might be physically well you know they're feeding well they're thriving they're not jaundiced you no know, otherwise absolutely well but actually hanging on to those parents keeping them on the books for as long as we can is probably a good idea and I think we could justify that because yeah, it might be when you start to take your baby out that somebody says, "Oh, well, what's wrong with that? Or why have you got why have you got your baby growing on? You know, with the bits on all the time, and mm. you might be hiding something as a parent. You just don't want somebody to comment on it, and you, your confidence as a new parent. It's it's scary enough when everything's gone perfectly well, but when you've got a curveball thrown in there as well, it's important to keep those channels of communication support open." And I think, as Ruth said, allowing people permission, giving people permission to say it's not OK. I am struggling. Yeah, I do feel guilty, but they might not tell you organically and naturally. But if you open that conversation up mm. and touch base with them and say, how's it going? How was that first session at you know the mother and baby group? <laughs> it was horrendous. Or, or you know, what? it was OK. Everybody was really supportive. Or people wouldn't come near me because they felt like their babies could catch something it's not a catching thing but people all sorts of imagine mm, yes, yeah. uh, 
So yeah, I think very careful monitoring of these families and making sure that everything is in place for them. Mm. I mean, do you think this is a question for Ruth? I think because you've had maybe longer experience in, within this sphere. I mean, do you think people are more accepting of difference now than they perhaps were? I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Because I'm, I'm sort of very conscious that sometimes kids can be very unkind to other kids if there's a difference, can't they? If you, you know, well, that's, that, that's, that's likely to happen when they go to school. And it, it, mm. it's, around, it's around strengthening. If you strengthen the parent, the child will be strengthened to be able to cope with comments. Mm. And it's working with them to give them a um, uh, to give them a uh, somebody will say what's happened and they'll somebody else one of them when they're older might say oh well I had a shark bite or something they'll make a <laughs> joke of it well it, it, it's true and and yeah. this is reaches a job if you like to yeah. uh, to give the tools to the child to be able to cope with the comments but you have to start with the parents yes. so it's, it's again being the po the positivity all that is that this child will be normal and mm. nobody need worry about it okay they've got a bit of a difference but they're going to run around with the other children in the playground mm. and, and it's a sort of helping it's a process it's not going to happen immediately and you're I know as midwives you're only involved at the beginning but that's a very crucial time for those mm. parents mm. Um, I mean, I say the breaking bad news is that you hear everything when you're given bad. I mean, I've I've been through it, and and you remember everything, um, or certain things stick out in your mind as to how that was delivered to you at the beginning, and the positive approach makes a huge difference for those parents, and it mm. then make them find it easier to to handle the mm. child through school and and their growing their development. So actually, parents need to, uh, it makes me un underline, they need uh, the, the support of reach because they need those other parents and other kids and all the resources that are available. I mean, I was actually quite shocked at the figures you were sharing yeah. about how, how parents didn't feel supported and they didn't have information, you know, even quite on early on because you kind of would assume they might not have everything, but they'd have, or maybe that's a perception of what they felt they needed. Maybe that's that's why the perception no, that's is low. It's, it's difficult, Sue, because I'm, you know it's individualised, and there is such huge variation. And ordinary, as I say, ordinary healthcare professionals, I shouldn't say that. Your first the first responders don't have that information. It has to be from the specialists. Mm. We have a responsibility as a, I'm talking as a specialist surgeon here. Um, we have a responsibility as well um, to manage that um, bit of information, which you can't possibly give, but mm. you can take a positive approach. Fabulous. Well, I have to say, I did say, and I always say, this hour always goes the fastest in the week. And I have to Close, close the session. But before I close, I'll say a huge, huge thanks to Ruth and Tasha for sharing their skills and their knowledge and sort of highlighting the really important things we need to think about as midwives and as student midwives. But I also need to underline the new leaflet from Reach that Ruth was mentioning because I've seen, I've seen the not. It's not even an embryo. It's a bit more than an embryo. It's a little, little new baby coming along. And that will be available on the REACH website, which is on your resources sheet. Um, and also the article is also available there and it's free access. And I have noticed recently that some articles are not free access and you get a tantalizing little bit of an abstract and they're not the full thing, which I know as a student and a midwife is incredibly irritating. But this one is available, all available. So, and that's fantastic. So. In conclusion, a big thanks to Ruth and Tasha and also to Jack, who's behind the scenes, making sure everything's carefully recorded um, so that if you missed any of this or you want to rerun re it, because there's lots and lots of information in this. And those of you who are watching may want to share with your colleagues, um, especially for student midwives or for midwives who maybe were coming on doing their NIPE or their um, SEN the systematic examination we've got a whole new language these days 
um, you can access it and replay, and that that's fantastic um, because um, Jack will make sure that's happening. Also, for those of you who like, I can't believe this, the six o'clock in the morning podcast on Friday morning, it will be there because Jack will make sure it's there as well. And I'm going to see you next week. Next week on Maternity Midwifery Hour, we're looking at gen genetics and genomics for maternity services. So we're keeping very up to date here. And we've got Wahida Abbas, Joe Hargrave, Karen Creed and Donna Kerwin with us to share the knowledge about information that's going on there. I'm also going to raise the lovely Southwestern festival which is on i know this seems like the after the summer the 17th of september in bath and, and that's available now for those of you to book in now if you're doing any interesting practice or research also the call is open for you to put a paper in to be presented there and bath is a lovely place and you could you can mix it with a little weekend trip as well. It's nice shops and it's a very, I think they do Bridgerton filming down there, unless I'm much mistook. Yeah, you see, so it could be a little weekend away. So take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week. And thank you again to Ruth and Tasha. Take care. <laughs>